we're going to be talking about not how to get rid of it, but how or rather what causes it. Because if we understand the cause, if we understand the root cause, right, of a yeast overgrowth, then we can take corrective steps in our lifestyle and our diets and we don't end up have we don't have to end up chasing detox programs for the rest of our life which is where a lot of you you know have have found yourself in struggling in that detox arena you know the next yeast free diet protocol or the next yeast free supplement that you can take or the next medication that's antifungal whatever that might be so we're going to talk about root causes what causes the yeast overgrowth i should reword that or re take out the of uh, because that doesn't make any sense. So what causes yeast overgrowth? How many of you at some point in time have had a yeast overgrowth or have struggled with a yeast issue? Whether it be, you know, if you're a woman and you've had a vaginal yeast overgrowth or whether you've had an oral infection or whether you've had yeast growing under your nail beds or yeast growing on the skin creating eczema-like conditions or whether you've had a GI tract yeast overgrowth or whether the doctor has done a blood test and, and told you you had candidiasis and, and that you had yeast in your bloodstream, yeast antibodies in your bloodstream. Uh, if you've had yeast before, go ahead and type in yes yeast um, and give me an idea for how many of you have actually struggled with this problem. I want to kind of get a feel for how many of you are going to be able to take this advice to the bank tonight because again, that's what it's all about is, is uh, really helping you understand where this is coming from so you can apply it. Now, we talk about what causes a yeast overgrowth and we'll understand that a lot of the treatments become unnecessary if we live a lifestyle that counters the cause. So if we look at the number one cause in my experience of yeast overgrowth is gluten and grains. And one of the reasons why, there are actually several different reasons why. One is that many people are gluten sensitive. And so if you're gluten sensitive, understand that eating gluten and grains can cause immunosuppression. And so one of our other reasons as we get into other reasons, immunosuppression is a cause. So if your immune system is being suppressed, whether it be what you're eating, what, if you're allergic to foods that you're eating, or whether you have a gluten sensitivity, or whether you're allergic, or not allergic, but whether you have a, a medication that you've been put on that causes immunosuppression, you know, there's a lot of things that cause immunosuppression. But again, gluten and grains can cause an immune suppression and that can lead to the opportunity for yeast overgrowth. But gluten and grains, there's other reasons. So one is immune suppression. But one of the other reasons is that yeast thrive in people that eat gluten and grains because gluten sensitive individuals alter their microbiome when they eat gluten. So it can alter your microbiome in favor of yeast promotion. So understand that's actually been really well studied is that people with gluten sensitivity who get gluten exposure actually end up having lower levels of bifidobacter lactobacillus, which are two of the predominant species of helpful bacteria that live in your gut that help to prevent or reduce or um, um, minimize the overgrowth of yeast. Remember, we all have yeast in our gut. It's not yeast that are necessarily this bad, evil thing. It's the yeast that when they overgrow, when they grow out of control, create a number of different biotoxins, including mycotoxins or mold-based toxins that can basically have a lot of other untoward side effects. And so again, gluten and grains, one of the top causes. Now, one of the other reasons why gluten and grains, because they're high carb. So one of the things that can feed a yeast overgrowth is a high carbohydrate diet. Now, uh, let's make sure I spell that right for you. Um, high carbohydrate diet will feed the yeast. So again, when you understand what yeast like, they like carbs. That's their favorite food. They actually can take carbohydrates and ferment them and create alcohol. And there's something called auto, auto brewery syndrome, where when you have a really, really bad enough yeast overgrowth and you really don't comb down the carbohydrates, you can actually start creating your own wine. Like right here in your gut, you create your own wine factory. And I've seen people with this problem that were so severe that they had liver jaundice, like their eyes uh, were yellow, their skin was turning yellow, they had liver damage as a result of all the alcohol they were producing internally because of that severity. Now, not everybody has it to that degree of severity, but a high carbohydrate diet will definitely feed yeast populations. And of course, the grains, the gluten and grains uh, are very, very high carbohydrate. Now, certainly there are other foods in that regard that can do it as well. Too much excessive fruit falls under high carbohydrate. Uh, high carbohydrate based root vegetables like potato and tapioca and cassava can contribute again to 
uh, overfeeding of yeast populations, normal yeast populations in the gut, making them stronger. So you got to keep that in mind that too many carbohydrates, you know, we went through an entire, uh, an entire decade in the 80s, it was no fat, low fat diets. And what was it? It was high carbohydrate diets. And what did we see happen? We saw yeast overgrowth skyrocket. We saw autoimmune disease skyrocket. We saw all kinds of problems, heart disease skyrocket. And this is one of the big reasons why is that a high carbohydrate diet feeds an overgrowth of yeast. And that again, creates problems for humans. So grains are altering of the microbiome. They're high in carbohydrates. Sometimes grains are contaminated with mold or mycotoxins. And so this has actually been really well studied. If we're talking about a mycotoxin, a mycotoxin um, is a mold toxin. And understand that grains are contaminated largely. A lot of our grain crops are contaminated with mycotoxins. It's one of those things that farmers really have a struggle controlling are the mold and the mycotoxin levels in our grain-based foods. So there are mycotoxins like aflatoxin and acrotoxin that are commonly found in foods that remember what mycotoxins can do is they can create an immunosuppression, which can make it easier for a yeast overgrowth to occur. So it's not, mycotoxins are not mold, they're a byproduct of mold. But again, because of their side effect of immunosuppression can contribute to an overgrowth of yeast. So, so far we're just, again, we're still just on the gluten and the grains, altered the microbiome, high carbohydrate diet, contaminated potentially with uh, large quantities of mycotoxins. And some of the grains, um, are contaminated with heavy metal. Particularly, what we've seen is rice containing arsenic, lead, and cal uh, not calcium, but arsenic, lead, and cadmium. And these heavy metals also create an immunosuppression. So again, just makes it easier for this to occur over time, the more of this that you're eating. This is one of, the, one of the reasons I wrote No Grain, No Pain was to talk about the reasons that grain can be unhealthy for people aside from gluten, like not including the gluten, right? So again, all grains have gluten, but not all grains are, and rather all, all let me reframe that, all grains have gluten, all grains are high in carbohydrate, all grains are content, have, can have the potential for mycotoxin contamination, and not all grains, but many grains can be contaminated with heavy metal. These last three things don't have anything to do with gluten. They have to do with the property of the grain itself. So a lot of people say, why no grain as opposed to why no gluten? That's one of the big reasons why is because it's not just the gluten. It, or it actually is other things. Now, there are a couple of other big reasons why we want to avoid grains if we're trying to stop and prevent this from recurring. And one of it has to do with that there are a family of proteins and grains particularly in wheat, called ATIs, amylase trypsin inhibitors. Now, ATIs can shut down your digestion, so it makes it harder for you to digest your food. And again, when you have rotten food in your gut, that makes it easier for yeast to step in and start processing and digesting and eating that food, so it gives them fuel. But the other thing that ATIs can do is they interact with a special receptor in your gut called a toll-like receptor, and they can trigger, and this is not gluten, so this is not a gluten response, but they can trigger inflammation and leaky gut over time. So again, if you're triggering chronic inflammation, what does that do? What does chronic inflammation do? Chronic inflammation feeds yeast. Let's talk about why. Chronic inflammation sends a message to your adrenal gland to push out cortisol. Cortisol causes elevation in blood sugar. Blood sugar feeds yeast. So again, chronic inflammation by itself, does the inflammation doesn't feed the yeast, but it's your body's response to the inflammation that elevates your blood sugar in a manner that's consistent with being able to feed yeast much more easily because it releases more blood sugar to, um, to address the stress response. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.